Hi, so I'm Nicholas and I'm going to present our paper on cryptanalytic extraction of neural network models. This is joint work with my co-authors Matthew and Elia who worked on this with me when they were at Google. So the basic question in our paper is we have some machine learning model which exists in some black box and we're allowed to make queries of this model with arbitrary images and observe the arbitrary outputs. And the parameters of this model have already been loaded into it, but we don't have direct access to those. And so the question is, as the adversary, if we're given access to make arbitrary image requests and are aware of the type of model that's being deployed and are able to see the outputs of the model, but don't know what the actual parameters are, can we solve for these parameters given these other variables? Now, the reason this is important is that machine learning models are very, very expensive to train. So the recently released OpenAI's GPT-3 model took probably roughly $10 million to obtain these parameters that are loaded into it. But everything else, um, the, like the, the architecture was actually fairly easy to be specified ahead of time. And so it's very valuable for companies to be able to protect the intellectual property of the, their, their parameters. Um, and so the question is, can, from the adversary's perspective, can we steal them? So we're going to try and answer this question. Um, given query access to a neural network, can we extract these parameters from the model? Now, there are two ways you can view this problem. The first way is what most prior work has done and studied this as a machine learning problem. Um, neural networks are types of functions. Machine learning is good at function approximation. So let's treat the neural network that we have access to as some supervisor and use this to supervise the collection of some new data set. We're going to train a new model in this data set and use this in order to solve our problem. And that works reasonably well. What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and do a different approach and solve this as a direct mathematical problem. Treat the neural network as a sequence of functions that we can analyze directly and try and actually recover the weights that way. And the reason why we're going to do this is that this is going to let us actually recover nearly identical models instead of just a similar model that solves a similar task reasonably well. So this is our question. Given query access, can we extract a neural network? And basically the answer to our paper is says yes. Um, we are able to do this with various caveats. Okay, so in order to understand our work, I need to give a little bit of background on how neural networks work. Uh, for that, fortunately, just about a minute is sufficient. So neural networks are a sequence of linear layers with nonlinear activation functions um, where each layer has a bunch of neurons. So the way this works is I have some values that go into the input. This is maybe the bits of an image. And then the neural network will propagate these values through, process them at the neurons, apply some nonlinearity, repeat this process layer after layer, until finally we end up with some set of values which give us the final output of the model. And this final output of the model is then emitted to the outside world as the result of the neural network evaluation. Now if I zoom in on one of these neurons to show you what's going on here, the input neurons have some value, and the way that I compute the output neurons value is I basically just take the dot product of these with the weights. Now the weights here are A1 and A2. These are the parameters which we're trying to learn, which we don't have access to, but what we can do is provide arbitrary inputs. So all we're doing here is just a dot product and taking the sum, or if you view the entire layer as one operation, a matrix multiply. Now if neural networks were completely linear, this would be very boring because they would all collapse down to one layer. So we have to introduce one single nonlinearity, and most often um, is the ReLU activation function. So that's what we study in our paper. And the way that this works is literally all you do, it's a rectified linear. We're just going to take the max of the input and zero and just compute this as the only nonlinearity in the entire neural network. So sort of zooming back out, we're going to do a dot product and then take the nonlinearity with this ReLU, and we're going to do this for every single neuron in the neural network. Okay, and that's all that machine learning is for the purpose of this talk. Uh, it, our results are independent of anything else about how this model itself was trained. So let's talk about extraction then. So the way that we're going to phrase our question is given Oracle query access to a neural network, can we extract the exact model? And it turns out that there's a proof of impossibility here that says we can't hope to achieve this. 
And there are multiple neural networks that compute the same function, um, but have different bit representations. So the best we can possibly hope to achieve is what we call functional equivalent extraction, which means that now what we're going to try and ask is just ask for any one model which behaves the same on an input-output behavior as the model we're trying to steal. Turns out, again, there's another proof of impossibility here that says we can't hope to achieve this for some pathological neural networks. And so what we're going to ask instead is, in the typical case of a neural network learned with stochastic gradient descent, uh, are we able to achieve functional equivalent extraction? And then the main result of our paper is to say that, yes, empirically, we are able to do this. OK. So now let me give you some background on how previous attacks have tried to approach this direct extraction. There are two papers here that have done this, and they both work for the case of one hidden layer neural networks. The visual intuition for these attacks will go something like this. Um, neural networks that have one hidden layer look like this. Um, the number of neurons in each layer is arbitrary. I've put two input neurons here because that lets us draw them nicely on slides. Three hidden neurons for simplicity and one output without loss of generality. So the neuron exists like this and if we draw the, what the neural network actually looks like, on the plane it looks like this. What I'm showing here is each point here corresponds to a potential input to the neural network. Where along the x-axis, we're varying the first neuron, and along the y-axis, we're varying the second neuron. Now, each of the colored regions here corresponds to a linear region within this function. Recall that neural networks are piecewise linear functions because of how they're constructed. And what you should notice here is not the fact that there are these seven different regions, but instead the fact that there are really these three lines that divide this region into spaces. Now, each of these polytopes has the property that um, we are in some particular linear region with respect to the neural network. So maybe this, this first line here might correspond to the, what we call the critical hyperplane for this middle neuron, where if you're above here, then you're in the positive region, and if you're below, then you're in the negative region of this particular neuron. Similarly, for the other neurons, we have this positive and negative side. Now, what this means is that I can, what I can do is I can label each of these polytopes um, with, the neuro, with the positive or negative sign assignment of each of these three neurons. And if I zoom in on just one of these, what this means in particular is that the neural network we're actually considering, if we're within this one linear region, only has the neurons that are active actually being applied and the other ones are inactive, which essentially means they don't exist. And we could collapse this again down to just one single linear layer. OK, so that's what's going on in these diagrams, and they'll be important later as well. So the basic observation that prior work makes is that the location of these hyperplanes almost completely determines what the function is that the neural network is evaluating. And the reason why that's the case is that it turns out that given where these hyperplanes are, we can directly learn values of the weights of the neural network. So why is that the case? Let's suppose that we had some particular input that was on this critical hyperplane. Now, if we took a small direction in the red axis, I'll call this the x-axis, and then asked how far do we have to travel in along the y-axis to get back on the hyperplane, that allows us to compute essentially the normal vector to this hyperplane. And it turns out we can use this to directly learn pieces of information about the weights. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a look again at the neural network. And let's suppose that we have this value x and y that is at the critical hyperplane, which in particular means that this middle neuron is now 0. So what we can do is we can say, well, what if we go to x plus epsilon? Of course, this is going to change all of the values in the neural network into something we don't necessarily know. But what we do know is if we now change y to y plus delta, then we again have the property that this middle neuron is 0. And in particular, if we now look at the weights going into this neuron that's 0, let's call them a1 and a2, then we can learn the piece of information that negative epsilon over delta equals a2 over a1. Because the only way that we could have both x and y leading to 0, and x plus epsilon and y plus delta leading to 0, is if this assignment held true. So this is good, um, but there's one thing that we lose. And the problem is that while it's true we learn the ratio of these two weights, epsilon and delta here, <coughs> what we don't know is the magnitude of this vector. 
we don't know how big it is. Now fortunately we can push any positive constants through to the next layer and things will just work themselves out. Uh, the problem though is that we lose information is we lose whether or not this is pointing up or whether or not this is pointing down. And this sign information is actually a critical piece of information that we just lose and can't recover. And it turns out that uh, local information is just insufficient to recover this neuron sign. So we need some way to recover it. And the way we're going to do this is basically brute force. So all we're going to do is we're going to query the neural network on a couple of different random points. And then say we know the weights of all of these now because we know the normal direction. We just need to recover the sign. So this means that there are eight possible assignments to the sign because we have three neurons in this hidden layer. In general, it's an exponential number of neurons we need to recover the sign for. And we're just going to ask for each of these possible sign assignments, could the function have the values that we queried at these points? If the answer is yes, then we've extracted the signs correctly. And if the answer is no, then we just try the next sign assignment. So we might maybe guess initially that all of the signs are positive, positive, positive. And then we check the sign assignment. We check that this, is, this works. And if it doesn't, then we try positive, positive, negative, and repeat until we find something that happens to work. Now, once we have the first layer with the signs extracted correctly, now we can extract the second layer trivially because it's just a linear function. We just directly compute with least squares and solve for the second layer. OK. So that's how prior work did this up until the point that I, we need to find these witnesses to these critical points on these hyperplanes. So that actually is, again, a fairly simple procedure. And the way that this works is we're going to draw a random line through the input space from maybe u to v. And we're just going to sweep across this line and look for discontinuities in the gradient. And the reason we can do this is if I plot instead of from like a top-down view of what's happening, if I plot the output of the function as we travel from u to v, we get a plot that looks something like this. And we'll see that now the output of the function has really three different lines at which the gradient is discontinuous corresponding to these four linear regions. And the points at which the gradient is discontinuous directly correspond to these critical hyperplanes. So that lets us very efficiently recover these points. OK. So the main contribution of our paper is to do three different things. The first thing we do is we show how to extract deep neural networks. Uh, these prior papers I showed you were able to do this in the case of neural networks that had one hidden layer, and we're able to extend this to arbitrary depth. The second thing that we do is we show how to do this efficiently. One other paper that came out around the same time as us was able to show how to extract deep neural networks, and we're roughly a thousand times more query efficient than that paper is. And the third thing that we do is we do what's called high fidelity extraction. And we can extract neural networks that are basically up to floating point precision, identical to the original model. OK, because of the t limited time in this talk, I can only cover one of these, so I'm going to cover just the first. And again, because of limited time, I'm only going to show you what happens in the case of two deep neural networks. These are neural networks with just two hidden neuron layers. So putting aside the stuff that I'm not going to talk about, there are two pieces to our attack then. As before, we're first going to recover the weights, and then we're going to recover the signs of the neurons. So. Getting started, a two deep neural network looks something like this, where now instead of just having one hidden layer, we have two. So again, I can show what the same diagram will look like. And again, we'll notice the space is partitioned into these polytopes of different regions that I've colored again, where each color again has one complete linear region. And now the sign assignments not, are not just for one set of neurons, but two sets of neurons. Neurons on the first layer and neurons on the second layer. Now, you'll notice that um, there are these same properties that there are these neurons that exist on the first layer where, as straight lines to the input space. But now we also have neurons on the second layer. And the way those work is these ones are bent a little bit by the first layer hyperplanes. If we were able to visualize what was going on with respect to the inputs to the second layer, this would look like a straight linear hyperplane. But because we're only viewing this with respect to the input space, which is then distorted by the first linear layer, what we see here is a bent hyperplane only because the first layer bends it. OK. So uh, 
the first thing we're going to do in our attack is we're going to recover the first layer up to sign as before. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to start off by drawing three, or in general, an arbitrary number of random lines through the input space and sweeping to find witnesses to these critical points using the same algorithm as I identified before. And now what we're going to do is we're going to try and use this information to not only figure out um, what, what the weights are, but like which neuron they correspond to on either the first or the second layer. And we do this through a matching algorithm. We're going to start off by pairing all neurons with all of the neurons, and we're going to say for each pair, um, could these neurons be witnesses to the same critical point, critical neuron being at its, um, be, same neuron being at its critical point. So for these two, basically what we're asking is, um, do their neuro, um, do their normal vectors align in such a way that we could have drawn a line through these two? And the answer here is no, because their normals don't align. We can ask this for the next neuron, for, for the next critical point, for the next critical point, and we can keep on going until finally we end up with now two points that are witnesses to the same neuron at the same critical point. And this means in particular that this is actually a constant linear region, and therefore this is probably a point on the first layer. And we can repeat this for each of the other layers, sorry, for each of the other neurons in order to identify all of the neurons that are on the first layer. Because only neurons on the first layer will match up in this way. The problem about this is that it's possible that we could spuriously have a situation where two neurons, um, where a neuron on the second layer is accidentally found um, because we happened to query it sort of very close to each other and we found something on the second layer. Um, but in practice, this occurs with fairly low probability. And if we do this enough times, um, these sort of things will just sort of be filtered out in the noise and the correct things will sort of bubble to the top. Okay. So this lets us recover, again, the three lines that correspond to, these, to, these, um, to the weights of the first layer. Now what we need to do is we need to recover the sign for this neuron. Is it pointing up or pointing down for all of these three neurons? Now, previously what we were able to do is we could just, through brute force, uh, enumerate a couple different values and just trial and error check. The problem is we can't do that again here because if I were to make some random queries, I would have to then completely extract the second layer in order to check if my solution was valid. And that's problematic because extracting the second layer actually requires queries. So therefore, my attack would not only be exponential in time, it would also be exponential in queries. And that's not something we're okay with. So we develop a more efficient procedure to do efficient um, sign recovery um, by efficient in queries, but not necessarily in time. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to start off with a single point that's on the hyperplane from the second layer neuron. And we know it's a second layer neuron because it's not a first layer neuron because we found all of those. And then we're going to trace its path through the input space and follow everywhere that it goes to in order to identify the line of the path that it takes. And once we've done this now, we can again do our same style of argument as before. We know that this, um, this is the path that it empirically takes. So let's try all possible sign assignments of the first layer and ask which of these could possibly permit the fact that this line exists in exactly this configuration. Because there are only really three variables that determine where this line actually is, which are the weights from these three neurons into the neuron that has now been bent. And so by enumerating all of the signs in the previous layer, we can check for a valid solution with an efficient number of queries, even if we have to do exponential compute. Okay. So the question now is then, how do we actually do this hyperplane following algorithm? And that again is fairly simple from an ideas perspective, but in practice has lots of implementation problems. So the way we do this is at some point in time, we're going to have a point on the hyperplane. And what we need to do is we need to figure out how to follow this point um, to make sure we stay on the same hyperplane and don't accidentally go somewhere else. So let's suppose that we had this point here and we follow it along, and following along is fairly easy. We just make sure we, we move um, not um, sort of dot product zero with the normal. Now we're at this point that's a multiple intersection point, and we need to figure out what to do. And ideally, we want to make sure that we move in sort of the correct direction. 
what we want to make sure we don't do is when we get from here to this multiple intersection point, we want to make sure that we don't end up and accidentally go along a first layer hyperplane or back where we came from. Uh, fortunately, both of those are relatively easy to prevent because we know where all of the first layer hyperplanes are and so we can just not travel on those and we know which direction we just came from. So by process of elimination, we can make sure we travel in the correct direction. Then um, we have all of the weights and the signs recovered from the first layer and so we can just peel off the first layer and completely rerun our attack exactly as before, starting from the second layer working on. Now, there are actually a couple more details, of course, that I'm not going to be able to get into. Uh, in particular, the two most important of these is that in practice we have bounded floating point precision, and the GPUs like to do all sorts of things that mess with us, and so all of our algorithms have to be numerically stable. And in general, um, when extracting deep layers, not all of the hidden states um, are completely accessible. For example, I can't feed a negative number into a neuron on the second layer because all neurons on the first layer have ReLUs. And so this is just not possible. And this complicates our attack somewhat for inner layers to extract, a deep, um, to extract deep inner layers of the neural network. Okay, so to briefly summarize our results then, um, here's sort of the main table from our paper. Where on the left we have the architecture. This is the number of neurons in each layer. Um, this is the number of parameters, the total number of weights in the neural network. And then what we have here are the number of queries we need to make of the model, and then various ways of measuring how well we extracted it, where lower numbers are better. So if you compare it to prior work that was able to do extraction for one layer neural networks, uh, our paper requires roughly twice as many queries, but has the benefit that it's maybe two to the 30th times more precise. Uh, which in particular means that um, the worst case error um, between our local copy and the remote mo model is at most 2 to the minus 30th in most settings. In the case when we compare it to prior work who was able to do deep extraction of neural networks um, with two or more layers, uh, not only are we now much more query efficient, again we can extract models that are much more uh, precise in how we extract them. To briefly conclude, there are a couple conclusions I think are important. The first of these is to say that this direct analysis of neural networks is a really um, useful way of thinking about machine learning. Uh, we don't need to care about the atom optimizer or if we're using RMS prop or exactly why batch normalization does or does not work. We just need to know that they're mathematical functions and we can analyze them directly. The second consequence of our paper is that the field of secure inference maybe isn't so secure. So a secure inference is a field that takes together secure multi-party computation and neural network evaluation um, in order to evaluate f of x when f is held by one party, x is held by the other, and they don't want to reveal their inputs to each other. Um, as a result of our attack, it means that revealing the value of f of x is as good as revealing the function of f if given enough queries. And so the field of secure inference is going to have to take into our attacks into account in order to design mechanisms to prevent these kinds of attacks so that people can't just query a model even in this MPC setting and still learn the parameters. Uh, more broadly, um, there's a talk by um, Matthew, who was the intern who, who, who was with us at Google when we were this, doing this work, called Don't Put Neural Networks in Your Ideal Functionalities. And the basic idea behind this is to say, that um, we in crypto like to think of maybe AES as if it was some perfect block cipher. Um, and broadly speaking, it is, and we can do that. But neural networks um, don't really fit well into any ideal environment and are incredibly leaky abstractions. And so for the time being, uh, it really is not advisable to try and idealize neural networks um, in any reasonable way. So with that, um, on Friday, we're going to have a live Q&A at 8 a.m. Pacific. Um, if uh, you're watching this after the fact, um, in a non-pandemic world, um, I'd be happy to take any questions over email, uh, and the code to reproduce um, our experiments in our paper is available online. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions in one of these two formats.